I think we'll get started. Uh, it's a little bit past 12, so I think we have a bunch of um, people who had signed up. So I wanted to welcome everybody back for our Lunch and Learn series. We're moving it to a different model, which we will do now every month for the rest of this year. And we reevaluate um, after that our frequency model. So we will, today's uh, speaker is Raj. He had done part one about uh, information security. So now he will discuss data privacy and IT audit. And he even has some job opportunities. And before I pass it off to him, just wanted to give some updates. Oops. So we're going to be moving to the first Fridays of every month um, for our lunch and learns. And just wanted to give an update. Back in June, we uh, participated for Giving Day, and the ICS alumni chapter raised a little over $1,300. So our motto was ICS stands for I Can Support. So for everyone that donated, uh, we just wanted to appreciate you guys for doing that. Please continue to be involved with UCI and ICS in whatever capacity you can. Um, attending these lunch and learns, getting other people to join, and if you can financially contribute as well, that would be great. Uh, just wanted to mark your can calendars for future lunch and learns. We have Raj speaking today about IT audit and data privacy. We have scheduled Michael Manorino for part two, um, again, more about personal branding and jobs, and we're hoping to get Dean Marios and the ICS team for October so, you know, just mark out your calendars for the first Fridays. We have some exciting programming. So without further ado, let us get to Raj. Thank you, Pooja. I'll share my screen. All right, so thanks for joining. Um, I think um, majority of you probably have some understanding of this topic given this is ICS, but uh, I'll try to keep it relatively high level and um, <coughs> go into too much detail in terms of the uh, tool we use for cybersecurity audits, but I will give you an overview on the methodologies. Um, so that way you have some idea of how cybersecurity is, is done uh, in terms of how we look at it from a audit perspective and then data privacy perspective. So I'll give you a broad overview of that. Um, my background, you can read it on your screen, but as I go through this, I just wanna highlight a couple of things. One is that um, there is a link to a white paper that talks about mm -hmm. internal audit and data privacy, which I put on the Zoom link. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about um, the role of, of internal audit and data privacy and how they kind of work together, you can uh, reference that. Also, uh, as we go through this, if you find the information insightful, um, I have two job opportunities that I know based on my network, uh, primarily people that are my colleagues. Uh, one is a, a opportunity for an IT auditor at Massimo Medical Systems in Irvine. They're looking for a senior IT auditor um, and that will be in Irvine. Uh, so that's a good opportunity, especially given the pandemic. And then a uh, second opportunity is with McAfee also in Irvine. That one is uh, on the cybersecurity side, uh, more focused on the penetration testing than the IT audit side, uh, but they're kind of interrelated. Uh, you have to kind of have a overlapping knowledge set to do either of those. And then uh, I think the McAfee position might be a manager level position, I'm not sure, but I can connect you with the hiring manager, the director, um, if you're interested in that. Uh, so you have my contact information. I think it should be at the end. Uh, if you don't have it, you can also find me on LinkedIn under Raj Sani, and you can uh, send me a resume through that. Um, I will go through what I do at Focal Point. You can read it later, but uh, just want to briefly say I'm responsible for the LA office, primarily focusing on the cybersecurity and IT audit side of things. All right, so on to our topic for today. Um, what I'm going to try to do is wrap it up in about half an hour and then focus some time for, leave some time for questions. Um, and then if you have any other questions regarding the position or uh, career opportunities, et cetera. Uh, so audit and data privacy, why I chose this topic. 
Um, so data privacy is an area that you see all over the news. Um, I think uh, if, if you haven't been following the news lately, then um, you know the Garmin hack is a big one. Uh, I think that one was a attack based on the wasted lockers. Some company from Russia called Evil Corp. I'm not even sure if that's the real name, but that's uh, the company that's taking credit for that attack. Um, I think that uh, not publicly available data, so it could be incorrect. Um, but they're saying that it started based on a um, a JavaScript a patch that was uh, sent to users in the company. And then the user was basically told to upgrade uh, based on the JavaScript. And that basically started the wasted locker encryption. And that led to their systems being down, uh, Garmin systems being down throughout their uh, operations in the US and worldwide. I think from a consumer standpoint, it was inconvenience. But uh, I think from a safety standpoint also locked out all the navigation systems uh, for the various airlines and all the, the pilots that use Garmin that uh, need to update maps, et cetera. So that's a pretty big hack, obviously. And I'm not really sure if $10 billion is the right number, but that's a number that's being thrown around in terms of the ransom that was paid by Garmin. Uh, so as you can clearly see, uh, uh, you know, these types of hacks uh, are getting larger and larger and larger. That's also why data privacy is becoming more in the news. Uh, so you see a lot of companies on your screen um, that are facing issues with um, data privacy regulation and being able to comply with those regulations. And it kind of goes into the cybersecurity area in general uh, because the companies themselves aren't able to classify the data properly let alone be able to protect that data. So in order to protect any data privacy, first you have to have very uh, competent data classification program. Otherwise, you'll never be able to protect the data to begin with. So it's all interrelated, but I'll focus more on the data privacy side for today. Um, so we talked about the data breaches. Um, I think the reason that internal audit you know, is becoming more involved now is because internal audit provides independent assurance over a lot of these key areas. Um, so internal audit's job function is to stay independent and provide independent assessment whether the programs for data privacy, cybersecurity are working properly. And to this date, there was no uh, data privacy audit program. Uh, one of the organizations called ISACA is responsible for issuing that guidance and they didn't have any guidance. So I actually helped them to create a, uh, a program for data privacy audit uh, that was published by ISACA uh, earlier this week. And so if anybody's interested in that, you can also find it on my LinkedIn um, or I can send you the link for that as well. So basically internal auditors are now becoming heavily involved in the uh, data privacy assurance area as they have been involved in the cybersecurity area. So in terms of the cost of data breaches, some of these are quantifiable numbers in terms of ransom paid, et cetera, but some of them are unquantifiable in terms of reputational loss um, and companies that tend to get hit once and you know, pay ransoms uh, once, they get, they get hit multiple times because uh, people uh, perceive them as being a company that's willing to pay. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily help you to pay the ransom. In the short term, you can get your data back, but in the long term, companies are gonna target you more and more because they think you're gonna pay the ransom. So it is not an area where uh, they're gonna to have to just keep paying, obviously, they'll have to figure out a solution. And so I think building out there, the data privacy program is gonna be pretty key because again, you can't qualify uh, or you can't quantify your data properly, you can't protect it properly. And the data privacy regulation is actually got a lot of teeth to it, um, especially in California, where we're talking about the CCPA. We have different uh, countries that have their own regulation, but the CCPA is the most uh, relevant for us, given we're in California. And there's actually a um, provision in the law 
for class, a class action lawsuits. So that will actually clear a lot of teeth in terms of enforcement, uh, being able to go after companies individually and collectively, um, rather than having the government uh, just doing the enforcement. So that's a, a key change from prior um, uh, lack of regulation, where if, for example, your data was compromised, other than the government, there really wasn't much that individuals could do. So now that gives them a lot of teeth to go after the companies, probably more on a class action basis. Um, so I think California is probably a um, front runner in the US, but obviously uh, GDPR is a big one. Uh, we'll kind of go through some of the differences between the two um, as well. And just want to point out that as the regulations become more and more prevalent, uh, you're gonna see similar regulations come out across the country. So what you see on your screen there uh, are the regulations that are proposed in each individual state, uh, very close to CCPA, uh, and some of them actually more stringent. And then there's also a national uh, data privacy cybersecurity law that is sitting in, uh, on Congress's desk uh, whether that gets passed this administration, this next administration, nobody knows, but it will get passed. Um, so we're likely to see the bigger states adopt their own provisions first, and then there'll probably be a, a national law. All right, so kind of going on to uh, the differences between GDPR and CCPA. I think the biggest difference I would say is the opt-in versus opt-out. Um, so I think in the GDPR, you have to opt in in order for companies to be able to collect your data. And then the CCPA, the option is really to opt out. So when you agree, when you go to a website in California, you go to the, um, the screen, you, you see the accept all cookies, et cetera. Yeah, at that point, you're kind of opting in and then you don't want them to collect any more of your data. Um, you know, you actually have to opt out, whereas GDPR is very focused on uh, opting in. You actually have to opt in to allow them to do any kind of processing of data. That would be, I think, one of the key differences. Um, and then the second biggest difference is that the expansion of, of personal data, how they look at uh, what, uh, what data is protected, that actually has become a broader definition uh, in terms of what they're covering and how they're covering it. Um, also, I mentioned about the, the fines. Uh, I think it's $2,500 per violation. Uh, and of course, uh, if you do it intentionally, there's a larger fine. But the key here is per violation. So it actually could be taken as per record. Um, so I think that's actually pretty significant when you consider the fact that some of these uh, violations have millions of records. So obviously, that can become an enormous number. I think one of the, the biggest fines was doled out to Facebook, um, is it, uh, I think, la beginning of, or middle part of last year. So you're gonna see bigger ones um, that are gonna be uh, resulting from CCPA. Ultimately, I think the companies, uh, when they realize the cost benefit in terms of compliance versus non-compliance, uh, that's gonna really f push a lot of these cybersecurity initiatives. Uh, in my work, when I do cybersecurity audits, um, GDPR, GLBA, different privacy audits, uh, what I find is that the issues themselves go unnoticed or they either don't rise to the level where the management wants to take action because they feel the cost and benefit is just not there. The cost to implement the solution is way more than the regulatory fines, et cetera. So I think that's gonna be a key driving force. Second one is the reputational damage. Um, so I think a lot of the times people do have short-term memories, but uh, I think when you're personally affected by the, the hack, like for example, in the case of Garmin or Experian, if you're utilizing any of those products, you might think twice about utilizing them in the future, uh, given that they had an issue with their data privacy. So kind of give you a flavor without going into too much uh, of what does the data privacy program look like. Um, the key thing to take away from this slide is it is not really focused just on 
information security and cybersecurity. So data privacy really impacts the entire organization. So you're, you're looking at, uh, of course, the privacy compliance and the cybersecurity aspect, but you're also looking at any data that flows through human resources, marketing, uh, even the third party and procurement because your uh, data privacy ultimately is dependent on your entire enterprise and extended towards your third parties. Um, so a lot of the organizations now relying on cloud service providers, they will become in scope, third party providers, they will become in scope. And then you're gonna have to look at how even marketing is collecting that data. Are they, are they keeping that data? Uh, what are they doing with the data? Is it data they can collect, not collect, et cetera? So it's not a exercise within data privacy and information security. It is really all encompassing when you look at the risk assessment. IT is involved heavily on the protection side, uh, kind of enabling a lot of the, the tools and technologies. So in uh, cybersecurity and audit, we call that the three lines of defense. Three lines of defense being IT, which is um, going to be helping to implement some of the tools, technologies. And then you have the compliance side and cybersecurity side that are going to be helping to implement some of the frameworks and controls. Um, the, the controls and frameworks depend on the industry you're in. A lot of government use NIST. Um, and then there's HIPAA compliance, uh, high trust compliance for the healthcare side. The banks use the FFIEC regulation. A lot of the other companies use ISO. Uh, so there are different frameworks based on the, the industry you're in um, and the company. So that's the second line of defense. And then the third line of defense is audit because audit ultimately is responsible uh, for compliance and making sure that the tools and, and the controls are working. And the reason they're responsible is because they have the ear to the audit committee, risk committee, and the risk committee ultimately reports to the board of directors. So they also control the pocketbook. So if there are issues with uh, cybersecurity and data privacy, then uh, audit can, uh, audit oftentimes does play the key role in securing the funds to be able to uh, remediate those gaps because audit will kind of do an ROI on, okay, this is the, the risk benefit and this is basically what it will cost. Ultimately, it is management's responsibility to fix those issues, but it is audit uh, who kind of helps to escalate that to the risk committee and the board of directors. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about assessments versus audits. So, I talked about the three lines of defense and the three lines of defense lends itself to assessments versus audits. Um, the second line of defense, which is more on the compliance side, they're going to be looking at data privacy and helping to create the framework uh, for compliance. The framework I've seen that's used a lot of times to meet with CCPA, GDPR, is the NIST Cybersecurity Privacy Framework. That one is very effective. And I think a lot of companies like it because it's uh, detailed and updated. ISO also has their own um, data privacy framework. But uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about this, you can Google search uh, NIST cybersecurity privacy framework. And I think that one is available for download. Uh, the ISO one, I think you do have to pay for that one. So I would uh, download the NIST framework and kind of uh, look at that one in terms of compliance. Interesting thing to note is that a lot of those data privacy requirements in the framework are gonna overlap with the audit requirements. Um, I think that kind of makes sense because um, audit is obviously helping them to assure that those controls are in place, but um, also because a lot of the work audit does, specifically IT audit, in terms of IT SOX compliance, general IT controls, uh, other areas, it also overlaps with data privacy. So it makes sense that you know, audit will be a partner to the enterprise 
in terms of the compliance uh, for data privacy. They've already done a lot of the legwork and um, they're utilizing very similar frameworks. The audit uh, will, will be independent, obviously, in their assessment. So whereas compliance will be doing assessments and, and will be uh, responsible for creating policies, procedures, governance, controls, et cetera, um, audit's responsibilities will be to make sure those, are con those controls are actually effective and uh, those issues that are gaps, things that have not been covered, uh, basically are covered. A lot of the times, um, you know, companies, they invest in cybersecurity and data privacy and, and it falls short. So it becomes audit's responsibility to make sure that they fill those gaps. Okay, I think uh, this slide, I think really speaks to the same point where we have uh, three lines of defense, but uh, kind of specifies some of the different, um, uh, I would say actors that are doing the validation process. You have the compliance side we talked about. We talked about internal audit. We also have outside experts. So outside experts would be, for example, um, in the case of CCPA, the attorney general will actually come and audit you to see whether you meet CCPA requirements. And obviously they will levy fines if, they, if, they, if you don't meet those requirements. You're also gonna have external auditors from the public accounting firms, believe it or not, coming and looking at cybersecurity and data privacy. Because now as part of the financial reporting, uh, the public reporting, the public accounting firms are required to issue a statement on the company cybersecurity that includes data privacy. So you're gonna have outside experts looking at it as well, outside of, uh, outside of uh, internal audit doing their independent evaluation. All right, so we talked about a little bit about what audit does in terms of data privacy compliance. Um, we talked a little bit about how they uh, go about doing the audit process in terms of risk, uh, looking at it across the organization. Some of the benefits that kind of yield from that um, are, are not just uh, related to fines and regulations, but also towards increasing efficiency of operations for the company, because ultimately the company, when they look at data privacy and cybersecurity, they're not looking at just from a lens of what are the fines, what do we need to do? They're also looking at it in terms of efficiency because they wanna make sure they don't stifle the organization in implementing these controls. So for example, if you have so many layers of access controls and people can't access the data, it's not really gonna help the organization in their business operations. So they have to do it in an efficient manner. That's another area where audit can really uh, you know, push that uh, to make sure that the enterprise is getting value from the tools and technologies. Another area I think that uh, you know, benefits that audit can provide, again, I talked about the uh, the business case, providing uh, a business case for uh, securing either more resources, um, like for example, um, McAfee, that opportunity that came about, um, you know, that resulted from the fact that there was an audit done and um, they needed more resources to be able to remediate those issues. And so okay. audit kind of helped them to find uh, the money, so to speak, to be able to remediate those issues. So they kind of play a role hand in hand there. All right, so this is a pretty key slide. I think I'm gonna spend some time on this slide. Um, this is the key focus areas for data privacy uh, and the audits. Um, so of these 15 areas, I think all of them are pretty important, um, but <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about three in particular. So number five, which focuses on the DPIA or data 
uh, privacy impact assessment. Um, I selected this one because if you don't have an accurate risk assessment, then you're not gonna be able to remediate the issues. You're not gonna be able to do it at least effectively, cost effectively, et cetera. So within the framework of, of NIST, when you look at it across the enterprise, uh, you're gonna probably identify X number of applications and systems. Then you're gonna have to identify X number of application systems that are relevant for uh, data privacy. Uh, and then within that, you're gonna have to look at what's the risk and you risk rate them. Um, what is the impact of the data in there? What's the risk associated with that data? Who has access? Um, how many records there are, et cetera. That kind of speaks to the general data privacy impact assessment. Of course, it goes into a lot more specifics, but the point there is that you can't do everything and you don't have unlimited amount of funds. Um, so you're gonna have to be very careful in how you scope the, the data privacy um, and the handling of the assessment, um, the handling of the controls you define, and then the scope of what application systems are covered, which ones are not. Um, so this is a key area because if you get this wrong, nothing else really matters. You'll be missing out on risk or your scope will be so large that you'll never finish. So <clears throat> before you uh, go about your journey for uh, creating a data privacy program, you got to make sure that this is done properly. Of course, we do a lot of these at Focal Point, uh, but I think that if you need help doing this, then we can provide you some guidance in general. Um, and then you can find out more information also uh, by looking at that uh, NIST cybersecurity privacy framework. The second one I would select out of this is number nine, which is the breach notification. And I selected this one because there are very specific fines associated with not having effective breach notification. Um, this is an area that is relatively black and white. Um, there isn't going to be a lot of leeway given if you don't report the breach uh, timely. Um, and then there are very specific fines levied. Uh, so this is an area where I think most companies either have or they're actively working to develop this uh, because of the fact that the fines are so black and white. And then the third I would select out of this um, is the third party risk management. And the reason I selected this one is because when you look at the organization, Oft, oftentimes people who don't do a lot of risk assessments and audits, um, they will say, okay, I have the XYZ system within my organization, and then <clears throat> XYZ is being done outside of the company. And so they say, I transferred my risk outside the company. I don't have to worry about it. That's not true. So since, majority of the companies now are relying on third parties, cloud service providers, AWS, Microsoft, et cetera, NetSuite. Um, that third party risk is still owned by the organization. And when the third party risk is owned by the organization, they're responsible uh, to make sure that whatever data privacy program they're implementing within the organization, has to extend to the third party. There are tools to help you do that. Like for example, there are service auditor reports or SOC reports. And the SOC 2, I think is the one you would probably need for data privacy compliance. That SOC 2 report uh, within there, it still requires the organization to be responsible for what they call complementary user entity controls, which are basically controls the organization is responsible for. Even if, let's say NetSuite is the vendor, the organization is responsible for those controls, not NetSuite. Uh, so when you create the data privacy program, 
you're responsible to assure that you maintain those controls. And um, when you look at the service auditor report for NetSuite, whether they're in compliance, you have to review it, management uh, has to review it uh, to make sure there were no issues on the NetSuite site, for example. And then it goes one step further because NetSuite is probably relying on their third party provider, for example, AWS. Um, so they have to make sure that AWS is also compliant. So it goes from organization to vendor to subservice provider. So there's actually like three layers and it all rolls up to the organization. So as you can kind of get the picture, it's a rabbit hole. So <clears throat> whereas you think you've just transferred all the risk and they're basically saying, no, you haven't. So <laughs> you have to be very careful when you send the, the data uh, out to an outside vendor, uh, making sure that you're still compliant with your data privacy requirements. The other areas in this are uh, just as significant. We talked about <clears throat> the data classification. Uh, there's also data minimization, which is basically to reduce the amount of data that you're having to deal with and then making sure that uh, you're only keeping relevant data a lot of the time, the organizations will just collect data because everybody's saying data is valuable, which it is, but then also increases your risk exposure in terms of data, uh, data privacy compliance. So it's kind of a give and take there. I'll let you go through the rest of these. If you have additional questions, then feel free to reach out to me. I think we're approaching 1230-ish. So I'm gonna to try to wrap it up in about five minutes or so. And a little bit talk about um, you know, the career opportunities. This slide is like a year old um, because I also am the IA academic chair. So I go to present this at the UCI and Cal State Fullerton. So students want to know, but this is about a year old. Um, so in terms of UCI and, and ICS, um, I think that ICS is actually uniquely positioned to take advantage of the careers in cybersecurity because the security engineers are, as you can see from this slide, are very high in demand. So my work um, as an MD is closer to a chief security officer. But as you can see, the, if you're a lead security engineer, you're making almost as much money as a chief information security officer. Um, to get a lead position as an engineer probably requires 10 years of engineering experience. But even if you just get in as a, a cybersecurity engineer, you're gonna be making a lot of money. So I think given that ICS is heavily focused on uh, code development, algorithms, analysis, um, I think now they have a center of cybersecurity. I think that you know it makes sense for ICS to really push uh, students um, into looking at cybersecurity just because the demand is there, the, the pay is there, um, and then of course they have an interest, um, then I think that's a great career opportunity. Uh, in terms of compensation, I would say it's probably one of the highest uh, in terms of careers in IT. And the reason I liked it is because I did uh, programming at uh, SoCal Edison. That was one of my first jobs uh, out of UCI. And I wanted to do something that was close to the business uh, and still be technical. So I started doing IT audit and security work because I work with the chief audit executive and the chief audit executive has responsibility across the organization. Um, so for example, anything that happens in the organization uh, has to meet with internal audit requirements, whether it is marketing, uh, whether it is financial accounting, IT, information security, operations, you name it. So basically you're the governance of the company. And then IT audit is basically a specialty within audit that talks about cybersecurity. So this way, you know, I have the best of both worlds. I stay in the C-suite and I'm very close to the, the, the risk committee and the board of directors. Um, I was sponsored to be 
on the Orange County Board of Directors recently um, because of that. And then I'm also very close to the cybersecurity area uh, because the IT audit uh, plays that independent assessor role that we talked about for cybersecurity, data privacy, information security. So for me, I wanted the best of both worlds. But um, I think given the, the um, salaries and job opportunities in cybersecurity, and if you're more interested on the programming side of things, then I would go uh, pursue that. Um, I think before we get into the appendix, uh, I just want to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Ritvik. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, hi, yeah, so um, I graduated from UCI this year and you know, I have a background in uh, network security um, and I have a, uh, about a couple of years of experience in, in network security and IT related roles. Sure. Um, and I'm currently interning for a uh, enterprise mobility company as part of the IT and delivery team. Okay. Um, I was just wondering uh, how important are certifications to potential employers? Is there something that sure. is of particular interest to them? Is it critical when you're looking at potential candidates or do they look at your sort of aptitude and, and uh, your passion for the job? Sure, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, cybersecurity and IT audit um, are unique in the IT space because of their reliance on certifications, uh, which actually is beneficial, I think, when you're in the field and not beneficial when you're not in the field because it's a barrier to entry. Um, so I feel that um, you know, it, it is great for those practitioners, but in order to get into the field, I think that having the uh, certification is a barrier to entry and, and almost mandatory, I would say. For the cybersecurity area, depending on which area you're interested in, there are different certifications. Because I, I wanted to be on both sides, I have a bunch of certifications on the cybersecurity side and also on the audit side. So if you're interested in cybersecurity, I think the biggest one to get would be the CISSP. Now here's the catch. So all these certifications require five, year, five years of cybersecurity experience. So the certification won't be granted to you until you have work experience. I think one of the tricks there is that still sit for the certification, get the exam out of the way, put it on your resume. And in the resume say, pass the CISSP, pass the, you know, you can say the CISA is the Certified Information Security Auditor uh, or there's different ones for data privacy. ISACA just started a new data privacy certification. Um, but I think the CISSP is probably the most sought after for cybersecurity. And if you can pass the exam, especially if you're in school, then um, pass the exam. Because it will take you, I would say approximately four to six months to study for the CISSP. It's pretty thorough. It's not very deep, but it's very thorough. And so if you pass the exam, you can put it on your resume and most employers, I would say like 90% of employers will just hire you because you have the CISSP on your resume. Even though you're not certified, you can say I passed the exam. And then as you get your work experience and you can get certified. So yes, I think the certifications are, are, are very important. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would say is that don't discount uh, the training in ICS because those certifications are a mile wide and an inch deep. So when you're doing the work, your uh, knowledge you get and experience you get in ICS will be more important than the certifications. But the certification is more important than the, I would say the school experience to get the job. So I would say you would need both worlds. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Raj Lilly posted a question in the chat. Oh, one moment. <clears throat> I can just read it. Do you think you'll, do you think it is likely for the data privacy 
protection movement to move to a national or global standards level? And are there any movements pushing for that? Uh, right now, I think it will be country by country, uh, simply because there's no governing body that can enforce it across the globe. Uh, but uh, what we've seen with GDPR is that you obviously don't have to be in Europe for you to be in compliance. So if you are, for example, processing any data of a uh, European citizen, you become in scope for GDPR. So in that way, the standards are global. And uh, in terms of enforcement though, that's a different thing. So I think the, the big thing in the US was that people were like, okay, fine. I am in scope for GDPR because I have European customers, but who's gonna make me pay the fine, right? So is the European entity gonna come here and say, you give me the fine? And that was, I think the biggest issue is that the companies are like, unless you know, there's teeth to the law, then I'm not going to do it. There had been fines in the U.S., especially for big multinational corporations for lack of compliance. But for the most part, uh, you know, the European agency didn't want to go after the small fish. They went after the big fish. The CCPA, on the other hand, is different because it doesn't require government intervention. Um, companies, especially lawyers, can go after companies uh, as a private or class action and that can create a lot of uh, cost to the, the company. So the, the, the cost benefit equation has changed. Thanks, Raj, that's interesting. Okay, and in terms of the compliance and, and how much does this cost? I think that's another great question. One of the companies I started is, uh, I created a, a mobile app uh, for uh, teledentistry because I have a lot of dentists that I know of and a lot of in the family. So I wanted to create a teledentistry app and I was concerned about the compliance aspect of that as well. Um, I would say that one of the key things to consider in the uh, compliance area, especially if you're a small company, is to be very careful in drafting the disclosures and collecting information. So don't collect information you don't need. So that this data minimization like we talked about. And then uh, make sure when you do the disclosures, you have an opt-in that's very thorough and reviewed by an attorney. I had it reviewed by two attorneys. So that um, when users agree to use the platform, uh, you're not taking on more liability and you're in compliance with all the regulations. So those would be, I think, the, the key things is to kind of avoid the uh, regulatory impact by collecting less data and then making sure you get the right opt-in from, uh, from users, uh, whether it be you know, retail or you're doing a service, uh, make sure that you cover the requirements in that industry. I have uh, some examples in the appendix. I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but I think if, um, if Pooja makes the slides available later, you can go through them yourself. Um, one moment. So one of them talks about kind of what SAP yeah. security looks like. Uh, that way you get a key flavor for what IT security and audit does. And I, I point this out because, you know, this is not something that typically is taught within uh, the computer science area, although some uh, universities do have a course in SAP, but SAP security, Oracle security, NetSuite security, this probably comprises at least 50% of the public companies out there, so it's pretty significant. So I just want to give you a flavor of that and how it integrates with the business controls that I mentioned along with the IT controls. And then the last slide here basically just talks about uh, this is actually uh, issued by the Center of uh, Internet Security, CIS, and it talks about the role uh, of audit in terms of uh, mitigation of cybersecurity and information security risk uh, as compared to the technology. So you can see that audit basically plays a very significant role in that. Um, to end this topic today, I'll just talk about two of the opportunities that I have uh, through my network uh, for job opportunities. Uh, first one would be um, uh, 
Uh, let me close this. Um, first one would be through uh, McAfee. So one of my um, companies that I work with is McAfee and uh, the managing director there, he reached out to me for a cybersecurity role and that is a manager type role, uh, more focused on the uh, looking at uh, how to implement cybersecurity tools and technologies. Um, so that is, uh, I think in Irvine. So if you're interested in, in that, send me a message on LinkedIn and then I can connect you. And the second opportunity is for Mossimo Medical Devices. Uh, Mossimo has um, really taken off. Uh, if you look at their stock price, that's really taken off. And they are also pretty key to the whole COVID response. Um, so that is more on the IT audit side. They're looking for an IT auditor um, that will help them to uh, basically audit cybersecurity and uh, the enterprise systems. I'm not sure they run SAP. I think they might run NetSuite. Um, so that's an opportunity to learn NetSuite as well. And then because it's an IT audit, you're probably also going to be assisting on the business side of things. Uh, that includes some part of financial reporting, but more from an IT standpoint. So those are the two opportunities I have. Again, you can find me on LinkedIn. And then if you're interested, I can uh, pass your resume along to those hiring managers. If you have any questions uh, or if you have more, um, if you want to know more details on the job, you can also find me again on LinkedIn and send me a message there. That's fine too. I'm sending the link again through the white paper if anybody wants to check that out. That goes into more details of what I talked about today. Perfect. So it looks like there's no more questions. So again, thank you so much, Raj. It was very informative. Lots of lots of information to digest in 30 minutes, but you did a great job. So thank you. Um, again, like, follow, and share on social media. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Slack, and you can always email and watch the replay on YouTube. Looking forward to seeing everyone next month.